Hello, History 362. So today we're going to be talking about the rest of Alexander the Great's campaigns. Um, when we left off, he was uh, had just defeated the great royal army of Darius at Guagamila. Um, subsequently, he is able to capture uh, Babylon, a really important Persian center in Mesopotamia, and Susa. Um, Darius uh, flees with what forces he has, um, and Alexander then attacks Persia itself um, uh, through the Persian gates. And here he actually faces a, it's not a big royal army, but he faces a pretty tough Persian rearguard that is holding the pass. Um, the Persian gates is a, is a pass to the Zagros Mountains. Um, uh, and Alexander has another relatively brisk fight. Um, uh, and he's finally able to flank the Persian blocking position um, when a local promises to lead Alexander in a flying column on a kind of mountain path around the position, um, and Alexander flanks it and then is able to push through, um, allowing him to capture the sort of royal centers. I mean, maybe a, a capital is, is too anachronistic, but the royal centers at, at Pasigardi and Persepolis. Um, and here, Alexander, uh, he winters at Persepolis, um, drinking very heavily, partying very heavily. Um, and one day, during a particularly drunken uh, symposium, particularly drunken uh, uh, party, um, Alexander supposedly, uh, with the encouragement of a Thessalian uh, flute girl, um, decides to burn down the royal center at Persepolis. Um, there's no enemy around. It's not part of a sack. They've been they've captured it. Had been there for a while, um, but he destroys um, uh, the palace and the buildings around, um, uh, seemingly in just a fit of drunken rage. Um, uh, although um, whether this is sort of post facto justification or again, there are times when it's hard to tell. Is Alexander just a psychopathic frat boy? Or is he a clever strategic thinker? And again, maybe there's a little bit of both. Um, but those who argue, well, he's a clever strategic thinker, say, hey, look, in 330, when he's burning down the palace, um, he is facing a challenge back in Greece. The Spartans are revolting. Um, they've never joined uh, the expedition, and now they are trying to take a stand against the um, uh, force that Alexander has left in uh, in Macedonia to control the Greeks. Um, there's worry that the Athenians will join in this revolt. Um, and so perhaps Alexander is, by set in sacking Persepolis, um, is trying to say, hey, look, the, the Persians sacked Athens in, in 480, and now I've gotten my revenge, and I am the true friend of the Greeks. I'm the one who's revenged the sack of Athens. Uh, Athens, but not Sparta, had been sacked during the Persian Wars. I think that's actually a little flimsy. I think there is a just a there is a kind of psychopath within Alexander that, that kind of comes across in our sources. Um, there do seem to be some elements of rational outreach to Athens, though, in that um, uh, Alexander does send back when he captures Persepolis. There's statues in Persepolis um, that were taken from Athens and are now displayed there as loot. And this is pretty common in, in big imperial capitals. You can go there and see stuff that's, that's looted from all over the empire. When you go to the British Museum, that's exactly what you're seeing. The contents of the museum is stuff the British um, have, have uh, you know, that their power allowed them to accumulate. And Persepolis is no different. So Alexander does take those statues and send them back to Athens. And I think that, we could say, is a strategic act of trying to maintain the goodwill of a subordinate power that nonetheless has the potential to cause Alexander trouble. Um, I think burning the palaces, though, is just an act of sort of uh, psychopathic rage. Um, uh, now, Alexander um, continues uh, to now pursue, um, after, after uh, sort of taking a little break at Persepolis, uh, continues to pursue um, Darius, who's fled towards Ecbatana, um, and keeps fleeing. At, at Ecbatana, Alexander captures another huge store of Persian bullion um, between uh, caches that he's taken at Ecbatana and Susa and, and um, uh, Sardis. He is now the wealthiest man in the world. Um, uh, it seems the Persian kings, maybe less as a, a, a fiscal um, practice and more as just sort of an ideological 
um, uh, reflex, um, Persian kings hoard bullion. They're sitting on extraordinary amounts, extraordinary piles of bullion, um, and now Alexander's got it all. So A, money is not a problem for Alexander. He can pay a huge army basically forever. Um, um, and uh, uh, after taking Akhenatana, he continues to close in on Darius. Um, and uh, before Alexander, uh, in, in his pursuit, can capture Darius, a group of Persian nobles who are who have been fleeing with Darius, and again, a very small uh, force that's left, um, they basically decide they've had enough. Um, Darius has now lost two, two battles, huge battles that he's personally commanded. He's been kicked out of his royal centers in Persia proper, the homeland of the Persian Empire. Um, he's been kicked out of the... Uh, Ekbaktana is an old uh, Median capital, and the Medes are closely associated with the Persians. Indeed, it's unclear if there's even as much of an ethnic distinction. Um, he's lost that. And it's essentially, he's uh, th this is the vote of no confidence. They stab him in the back. Supposedly, he's, he's dying when Alexander finds him and then expires shortly afterwards. Um, now, one of these aristocrats says that he's the new king, um, and uh, the Greeks call him Bessos. Um, but after Darius is killed, he says, well, now that I'm the Persian king, I'm Artaxerxes V. So there is still a Persian king for Alexander to hunt down. Um, and Alexander now, after 330, moves into the um, what had been kind of the, the, the eastern part of the Persian Empire, um, which includes the sort of uh, parts of the Eurasian steppe um, uh, that, that come off uh, by, the, you know, by the Caspian Sea, um, uh, in particular a region called Bactria, um, and then where that starts to abut what's today the mountainous regions of Afghanistan, um, Sogdiana, um, is, one of the, is one of the big regions. Um, and so here Alexander is fighting uh, both against uh, sort of Persian rearguards um, who, you know, still kind of have hope that, uh, you know, they can fight initially on behalf of this Artaxerxes V, um, and also local dynasts, men who have sort of been served as uh, satraps and, and local functionaries for the Persians, but now are sort of saying, well, hey, Alexander's overthrown the Persian Empire, but why don't we set up shop for ourselves rather than having uh, to honor Alexander? So there, there is vicious fighting um, uh, in the eastern parts of the Persian Empire um, in 330, 329, down to um, uh, around 327. Um, and uh, uh, this oftentimes sort of resembles, rather than sort of big set piece battles, kind of guerrilla warfare. Um, and the tactics that Alexander uses are, on one hand, just massive and exemplary violence against populations that don't submit, um, and also um, colonization, um, starting to found Alexandria, the city is called Alexandria, um, where, as he has veterans who are just too old or too tired or too, uh, you know, don't want to serve anymore, he sets them up as garrisons in these colonies as a way of achieving permanent um, control. Um, he also marries the daughter of a Sogdian um, uh, nobleman. Um, uh, this is his uh, sort of first wife, Roxanne, um, and he will later start to marry um, a number of <clears throat> uh, Persian women, uh, including uh, at least uh, 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 two um, female relatives, I think a daughter and a sister of Doris. Um, so he's starting now to use marriage to try to uh, insert himself into uh, various elite networks in the Persian Empire. Um, so there's still fierce fighting, but after uh, the uh, burning of Persepolis, after the, the death of, of, of Darius, Alexander starts to have increasing friction with his own soldiers. Um, and uh, uh, this uh, friction uh, ultimately leads to violence. Uh, so in 330, um, uh, Alexander is notified that one of the sons of his leading generals, the son is named Philotos, he's the son of Parmenio, a, again, an important general that Alexander has inherited from his father. Um, supposedly, back in the day, Philip II um, had joked, he said, I congratulate the Athenians that every year they managed to elect 10 generals, um, because I've only found one general in my life who's worth his salt, and that's Parmenio. Parmenio is now is an older man, is still serving Alexander, um, but a plot that Philotus is masterminding, uh, or at least is aware of, is revealed. 
Alexander responds with a purge, Philotas is killed, um, and it doesn't seem Parmenio is really mixed up in this plot. But at this point, with the execution of his son, he's too dangerous to keep around, and Alexander has him killed as well. So in the moment of victory, we now have Alexander starting to turn um, uh, and, and uh, execute what, what had been one of his leading generals. Um, with Darius dead, Alexander basically says, well, no, no, no. Bezos, this Artaxerxes V, uh -uh, he's a pretender. I'm the new king of the Persian Empire. And we do know that Persian bureaucrats start saying, yes, in, in the reign of King Alexander, they, they treat him as a successor um, uh, uh, dynasty. Um, and uh, this leads to some problems because now Alexander has two sets of subjects. He has his Macedonians. And while, the, you know, while, while Philip had actually tried to really elevate the Macedonian monarchy, um, there is still this sort of rough and tumble expectation of social interaction with the king and his leading Macedonian aristocrats. They expect to drink with them, hunt with them, fight with them, war with them, um, and also speak quite freely to them. That, that while they all acknowledge that the king is in charge, um, there is a culture of free speech in the Macedonian court that is important, that you can actually stand and say, Alexander, this, this policy is no good, and we don't like it, and it's a bad idea, and I said it. Indeed, the drunkenness, the fact that this is a court where there's a lot of heavy drinking all the time, um, is one way to kind of facilitate that free speech. Everyone's already pretty lubricated, and this is sort of part of the courtly culture. Um, but now Alexander starts having Persians coming to him, and those Persians want to treat him the way they've treated the great king of Persia. Um, and uh, the, the sort of courtly rituals of the Persian court um, involve a set of uh, sort of uh, a, a staggered, uh, escalating ritual gestures that can range from um, blowing a kiss, um, ki actually kissing on the lips, all the way, and, and that's kind of so, if you blow a kiss, if you're just a little bit below the king, you blow him a kiss. Uh, if you're near equal to the king, you kiss him if you're one of his handful of higher, higher aristocrats. And then if you're really nowhere near to the king, you're, you're basically, um, uh, you know, uh, groveling on the ground. Um, so, but it's, it's a kind of staggered set that kind of lets people know where they are in the courtly hierarchy. Um, the Greeks refer to all of these sort of ritual gestures as uh, proskinesis, um, uh, which, is, which is essentially sort of groveling. Um, and it seems that Alexander wants to impose the practice of proskinesis, not just on the Persian officials who are doing, to, doing that to him anyway. They, that's how, the only way they know how to behave. But it creates a bit of tension in the court, right? If, if high-ranking Persians who are starting to come in as collaborators, and Alexander needs these guys. He can't run the empire without them. He doesn't know quote unquote, how to make the trains run on time. These guys control the supply depots, they, contr they control the flows of, of uh, surplus, the agricultural surplus and bullion and its distribution. Um, he needs Persian officials to collaborate with them and therefore he needs a, a strange way to kind of make them feel comfortable approaching him uh, with, with, the, with the, the sorts of ritual they're already accustomed to. And it's starting to become a little awkward when Persian courtiers are coming in engaging in the sort of appropriate uh, uh, proskinesis, and then um, uh, the Macedonians are just hanging around saying, well, what's that, what's that dude doing? Um, indeed, it, there's a story, whether or not it's true, of, of a uh, you know, mass, old cr cranky Macedonian officer watching a Persian uh, engage in proskinesis and saying, you need to hit your chin harder against the floor. Um, uh, so Alexander briefly attempts to institute proskinesis with his own soul, with his own officers. That is, they will uh, engage in the same kind of ritual gestures as the Persians. Now, notably, again, there's a there's a, a, a gradient. So they won't necessarily be groveling on the ground, but it seems that they're going to start with kissing. Um, uh, that being said, the Macedonians do not like this. Um, and indeed, the most prominent critic of this practice is Callisthenes. Calist uh, 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 the nephew of Aristotle, who's come along as the court historian, he really does not like the idea of, of going anywhere near incorporating Macedonians into this range of ritual gestures. Um, uh, uh, and indeed, um, uh, in a sort of early attempt in which Alexander is going to exchange these kind of Persian kisses with his leading officers, Callisthenes supposedly storms off and says, I'm going away a kiss poorer. 
Um, and basically, um, the pushback that Alexander receives causes this attempt to fail. Um, and it's actually a sign that while Alexander, you know, Mas that, that Philip has really elevated the Macedonian monarchy and Alexander even more so, sometimes through violence. Um, but there are still places that he's, he's not able to push his Mas senior Macedonian officer corps, despite his, again, kind of incredible, all-encompassing um, personality. Um, uh, now, that being said, while there is some pushback, of the bad blood remains. Um, and there is another kind of explosion, uh, literally, of uh, explosion of violence um, in Samarkand um, in uh, uh, 328, um, in which there is another heavy drinking uh, session. Um, and here, some of the Macedonian officers seem to be angry that Alexander is continuing to promote Persian collaborators into important positions. Um, and again, he may be doing that just because he's a, he's a fair guy, but he also needs to. The Macedonians simply cannot run the Persian Empire, even if they wanted to. Um, but nonetheless, this, this is a grudge as they see positions that could be, you know, plumb, plumb positions to, to, to you know, uh, uh, rake in the, 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 the silver um, and exploit the locals, but those are going to Persians rather than Macedonians. This is leading to discontent. Um, and uh, this discontent explodes at another drinking party, a symposium in, in Samarkand, um, when uh, Cletus the Black, the man who had saved Alexander's life at the Battle of Granicus, um, uh, supposedly quotes a line of Euripides, basically saying the, the commanders take everything and the soldiers get nothing. Um, and uh, this so enrages Alexander, who seems to be extraordinarily drunk, Cletus is too. Everyone's drunk. This is the culture of the court. Um, that he grabs a spear, runs Cletus through, and kills him in front of everybody. Um, now, Alexander the next day supposedly expresses extraordinary remorse. Again, there's a kind of psychopathic part of Alexander, but it, and so whether or not he felt remorse or not, I can't say. But he does express remorse. It seems, again, there are places that he, 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 he can't push the army. He can kill Cletus, but uh, he, there are political requirements that he then acted. This is really, really bothering him. Um, but it's another sign that, that tensions with his officer corps are very high, and there's always the risk that there will be another breaking point. Um, and yet another explosion happens the next year. Um, uh, here, the issue are the royal pages, um, the um, uh, Basilikoi Paides, the royal boys. Um, there have been these Macedonian pages. Again, these are, these are young, the sons of the Macedonian aristocracy. They come and live in the court. They serve the king, uh, who really can treat them in very degrading ways as a kind of way of imposing his discipline. But Usually they age out of this. You do this for a couple of years, you, you, you grow to manhood, and then because of your service as a royal page, you're ready to receive important administrative and military assignments, or at least start receiving your first kind of administrative and military assignment. Um, it seems one problem is that while these pages ordinarily spend a couple years in ordinary circumstances, Alexander has kept the exact same pages that he set out with in 334, and they are they haven't aged out of the page program. They haven't gotten the promotion that they've expected. Um, and it seems a number of these pages um, for this and other uh, uh, issues plot to murder Alexander. The plot is exposed. Um, and in addition to the pages, one person who is brought down in this is Hylicides. Um, who is uh, imprisoned and then executed. Um, uh, and uh, so, uh, again, you, we can see Eucalistines had led the successful pushback against uh, Proskinesis, um, and in, that may be one way that, the one reason that then he's someone who's singled out um, when this, this conspiracy of the pages emerges. Um, so <clears throat> uh, we, we have tensions running high with Alexander and his officers, um, and... I, you know, one reason these tensions are running high, Alexander won't stop conquering. Um, uh, you know, many of these guys had set out in 334 thinking that they were going to fight to free the cities of Asia Minor. And now they are in Sogdiana. Now they are at the Kindu Kush, 
um, in, 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 their, in what's now modern day Afghanistan. Um, and yet Alexander continues to campaign. Um, he's conquered the <clears throat> Persian Empire of, of, as it stood at the time of Darius. But there is a region across the Hindu Kush, which is they call India, we would now call modern day Pakistan, um, it's where the Indus River runs, that had at one point been part of the Achaemenid Empire, way, way, way back in the time of Darius I, say in the, in the, around the year 500 BC. And so because the Indus River Valley is ancestrally Persian, Alexander says, well, I'm the new king of Persia. This is ancestrally Persian territory. I'm going to take it back. I think they're also, I mean, again, we could call this sort of the sociopathic Alexander. The Greeks call it pothos, um, that Alexander has this pothos, this longing to pr pr you know, go to the next beyond. If that next beyond was the Danube, Danube River early in his campaign, that's where he wants to go. If it's crossing the Hindu Kush now, that's where he wants to go. He's driven by, again, this, this kind of half you know, psychological, maybe even mystical desire to cross the next boundary. And so Alexander's pothos takes over. He crosses over into the Hindu Kush with his army. Um, with the collapse of the Persian Empire, and of course we only know this from the historians of Alexander, but it seems that um, this region has sort of been taken over by local dynasts. Um, we can call them kings, um, uh, uh, rajas. Um, and so Alexander fights with a number of these dynasts. And again, he fights with extraordinary violence. I mean, these are people who have done nothing to provoke an invasion of Macedonians. And here they are. Um, uh, and so um, uh, Alexander, and again, there is a kind of pathological element to this. So there is a great uh, fortress that's controlled by a local dynast, uh, the Aranus Rock. Um, it's, it's a fortress on a huge kind of mastiff, um, and it's something that Alexander really just could bypass, but he has this pathological desire to say, no, that's an impregnable fortress. I will take it, and he does take it with great difficulty, building a large siege ramp, uh, failing in several attempts, losing a lot of guys and trying again, uh, and then, of course, taking it and sacking it with uh, extraordinary um, violence. But again, militarily, it may not even be necessary. This is almost, this, this is where the pathologies of Alexander um, uh, seem to be driving him and his army forward. And the question is, when will the army break? He continues to attack. Um, the most serious opposition he faces as he crosses into the, uh, again, broader Indus River Valley, the watershed, which includes a lot of the little rivers uh, that flow into the Indus, um, is from a chief uh, or a king named Porus. Um, Porus has a large and effective army. He also has a very large and effective elephant corps. Um, and uh, at the uh, uh, Pudaspes River, um, uh, Alexander confronts Porus, who doesn't want him crossing with this huge Macedonian army. Um, uh, and again, actually, kind of like the Achaemenids, we see a defense at the river. Um, this time, Alexander doesn't try to punch across. Instead, he, he at the, in the middle of the night, moves a large portion of his army up the river. He secretly fords uh, away, and then Chorus is surprised and has to turn and redeploy his army as Alexander uh, attacks him from uh, the near side of the river. A very bloody battle ensues. Um, uh, Alexander, uh, this time, actually leads a cavalry maneuver where he, he takes some cavalry, with, withdraws it around his army to strike the other side. That maneuver may be something that helps him win the battle, but overall it's just a bloodbath. Heavy casualties. Um, the first time, this is the first time that the Macedonians have encountered elephants in battle. And while they win, um, uh, it's a win at a great cost. And of course, um, you know, what does Alexander do once he's crushed Horus? He says, I, you know, the great king, say you can have your kingdom back from me. Um, uh, so this huge amount of bloodshed that, again, doesn't really seem to have a purpose. And then he keeps marching his men forward. Um, when they get to one of the last rivers that flows into the Indus, which means actually they're going to start moving out of the Indus River watershed and, and into the sort of um, high parts of the Ganges River watershed, um, his men mutiny at the uh, Hephaestus River. Um, they refuse to go any further. Um, and, and, and again, it's actually, I don't think this is surprising that they mutiny. Um, uh, he's been fighting this bloody battle in a distant, truly distant part of the world. Um, they're suffering heavy casualties and 
they've increasingly don't see the point. This wasn't the Persian Empire when we invaded. We conquered the Persian Empire. Why don't we just enjoy what we've got? Um, so they refuse to go any further. And here again, Alexander has to back down. Um, he, he's, he's pushed his men as far as they can be pushed. Um, so this, uh, this mutiny causes him to now uh, uh, move down the Indus River, still sacking towns and, and uh, 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 principalities as he finds them with extraordinary violence. And uh, in sacking one town, Alexander, again, always in a kind of competitive nature with his own men, or perhaps even a little desperate now that his men have rebuked him by refusing to march further, um, seeks to be the first person over the wall, goes over the wall, but the ladder cracks behind him. And so now he's stuck briefly by himself on the far side of the wall. He's shot twice with arrows. A couple of his bodyguards manage to get over the wall and protect him while finally more ladders can be brought up and the rest of his army uh, com comes in. But Alexander is now badly wounded. And for a period of time, it looks like he might die as his body is taken down the Indus River where a fleet is constructed. Um, and uh, Alexander recovers, and it's decided that his army is going to march back by land, while a fleet uh, led by Nearchus is going to uh, sail um, uh, uh, up the, um, uh, the Red Sea. So um, uh, this uh, it leads to another march, and this, this turns into a logistical disaster, because as he's marching back into what is now Alexander's empire, what had been the Achaemenid Empire, um, Alexander marches his army over the Gerdosian Desert, a huge stretch that has very little food, very little water, and Alexander hasn't made any kind of logistical preparations to get his army through this wasteland. Um, this is actually a, a flashing neon sign that, that Alexander, military genius, sucks at logistics. Um, now, this, again, may be foolhardy, it may be pathological. There are some who say, well, he's mad at his army and he wants to punish them by marching them across the desert so some of them die. Alexander is a sufficiently sociopathic personality. That may be correct. Um, uh, but nonetheless, losing many men in the Gerdosian desert, um, he returns to, back into um, his own empire um, where he suffers another mutiny in 324 at Opus. Um, again, his soldiers are mutinying. Um, in part because uh, some of them have run up debts and they want to try to finagle more money from Alexander. Um, also, Alexander is starting to put together a new army. After all, he's lost a lot of his Macedonian troops. Some have died. Some are just too old. Um, some have been settled in colonies. Um, and so Alexander starts, uh, after they've returned, producing a new army that's going to be uh, an army of mixed units commanded by Macedonian corporals, but with uh, many of the ranks being uh, Persians. And this is going to be for both cavalry and infantry. And a lot of Macedonians don't like this. They say, wait a second, Alexander starts having a, a Persian army or a half Persian army. What does he need us for? Um, uh, so there is a mutiny at Opus. Again, it is crushed through a combination of violence and uh, 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 promises of largesse and um, uh, but it's another sign, again, that, that as Alexander tries to now rule an empire that's mostly the Achaemenid Empire, with tiny Macedonia way off in the corner, um, this is going to create, a, this continues to create tensions with his, both his officer corps and his army. Um, one way that Alexander attempts to reconcile things after this mutiny is he holds a huge feast, um, and at this feast, he marries, basically, or forcibly, um, some 9,000 both officers and common soldiers to Persian women. And it seems that he kind of hopes that these, this, uh, these marriages will produce a kind of hybrid ruling class that Alexander can then rely on to rule this new empire. Um, uh, uh, and again, that, that th this marriage, which takes place at Susa, um, has, has been at times seen sort of optimistically, um, uh, uh, sort of, um, uh, Tarn sort of saw this as an attempt to actually create a kind of world peace by producing literally a new sort of hybrid race. Um, you may also just see that Alexander is trying to create a group of people uh, who are kind of personally loyal to him and unhindered by either Persian or Macedonian familiar net networks. Um, 
That being said, um, this whatever you know, uh, this attempt um, ends largely because Alexander himself dies um, uh, in Babylon in, in 323. Um, he has been drinking very heavily. He has also been sick with a fever, um, and he finally collapses and dies. Um, and this sets off a crisis um, because with the sudden death of Alexander, still quite young, um, uh, there is no obvious successor. Um, he does not yet have a living son, um, and therefore um, what we're going to look for is a civil war on a massive scale um, as his generals fight over the empire that he's conquered. And that's what we'll be talking about next week. See you then.